Hi everyone, we are jumping right back into the 1990s with this video. We're going to start with January 1st, 1994, and then move all the way through the end of the 1990s, ending with December 31st, 1999. So let's get right to it. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Minimize myself up in the corner here, and get started talking about NAFTA. This is the North American Free Trade Agreement. It came into force on January 1st, 1994, and it created a free trade zone between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. It was renegotiated and then re-signed by the United States, Mexico, and Canada in November of 2018. It is now known as the USMCA, the United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement. Um, at this point um, in the spring of 2020, the United States and the Mexican legislators, legislatures have ratified it and uh, the Canadian legislature is expected to do so soon. So we see a lot of free trade and updates of this trade agreement occur over the last 26 years. Then in the spring of 1994, just 26 years ago now, the Rwandan genocide occurred. It is also known as the genocide against the Tutsi. It was a genocidal mass slaughter of the Tutsi people in Rwanda by members of the Hutu majority government. Over 800,000 people were killed in the span of only 100 days. Genocide means a deliberate killing of a group of people, especially a particular ethnic, national, racial, or religious group with the intent to destroy that group in whole or in part. And the goal of the Hutu people were to completely destroy the Tutsi ethnic group in its entirety within Rwanda. Like I said, this occurred in the spring of 1994, over just 100 days between April and June of 1994. 70% of the Tutsi population, which was 20% of Rwanda's overall population, was murdered. You might remember back in the 1960s, we talked about this then, uh, Rwanda was split into two countries. It was split into Rwanda in the northern part and Burundi in the southern part. After that split, the Hutus had continued to attack the Tutsi people. Remember, there was a lot of anger from the Hutus to the Tutsis. The Tutsis had been raised up by the Europeans and the Hutus had been pushed down and the Hutus came to resent the Tutsi people greatly for that. So the Hutus, even after the split, continued to attack Tutsis. Well, in 1993, a peace agreement was signed and the United Nations came to Rwanda to make sure that the peace agreement was upheld. Well, even though that peace agreement had been signed, the violence continued. And by March of 1994, everyone, the United Nations peacekeeping group and force, all of the countries that had business in Rwanda, everyone had left, except for the Red Cross. The Red Cross is the only organization that stays in Rwanda throughout the genocide. Then on April 6th, 1994, the presidents of both Rwanda and Burundi were in a plane together and the plane was shot down. Both presidents were killed, but the Hutus blamed the Tutsis, and the genocide began that night. This genocide was a very personal genocide. Neighbors rose up against neighbors, Hutus and Tutsis that had known each other, that had lived next to each other, that were part of the same community. Hutus took up arms. They used knives, machetes, clubs. These are personal weapons. These are not weapons that you can use and kill from afar. They used these weapons to kill 
people who had been friends and who had been neighbors. In total, about 100,000 children were murdered as well. And in this 100 days, while these killings occurred, no countries came to the aid of the Tutsi people. Not a single country gave global aid. The United States, the United Nations, the United Kingdom, and Belgium were all very, very harshly criticized for their actions or lack of action and lack of a response after the genocide had ended. By July, the Hutu government had collapsed. The Tutsis had been able to defend themselves and a ceasefire was declared. A new government was established on July 19, 1994. This genocide, as I said, killed 70% of the Tutsi population in Rwanda. It was devastating to them. It is still devastating to the people of Rwanda now, just 26 years later. There are a number of books and movies that have been written, that have been made, all about the rote genocide in Rwanda. Had we been in school together, we would have watched a movie called Hotel Rwanda. I don't believe that it's on Netflix, um, but it may be on Amazon or Hulu. It stars Don Cheadle, and it focuses on a true story of a man who worked, a Hutu man, who worked to try to save many, many people during the genocide. Uh, some excellent books also about the genocide in Rwanda, uh, really giving people a glimpse, written many memoirs written by different people who were nearly killed um, and who faced major devastation as a result of the genocide in Rwanda. I highly recommend uh, many of those. And if you're interested, please reach out and I can give you a detailed list. Then on May 10th, 1994, so while the genocide was occurring in Rwanda, the first universal elections in which all races were allowed to vote was held in South Africa. And Nelson Mandela was elected president on May 10th, 1994, with major celebrations occurring with his swearing in as president. Then in 1994, Yasser Arafat became the president, or he had been the chairman, he became the president of the, he had been the chairman of the PLO. And so in 1994, the, um, the PLO, uh, part of it shifted a bit, and he became the president of what is known as the PNA, the Palestinian National Authority. He became an instrumental part of peace talks that continued even after the Oslo Accord was signed between the Israeli and Palestinian government. Today, um, the PNA, which was formed within the Oslo Accord, today it governs as the state of Palestine. So he, Yasser Arafat, became the president of the PNA in 1994, signifying that agreement, the Oslo Accord Agreement, and the willingness to uphold their side of the agreement. In July of 1994, in North Korea, Kim Il-sung, who had been the leader of North Korea from 1948 until 1994, died of a heart attack at the age of 82. His son, Kim Jong-il, took over. He would rule until 2011 when he passed away. Well, in his time of ruling, it was nearly 20 year rule, uh, he did quite a few things to change North Korea. Well, first he changed the name of the position. So instead of simply being the leader, uh, he changed his title to the Supreme Leader of the DPRK. Remember, it's the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK. He faced a lot of problems, though, in his leadership. Um, many of those problems included natural disasters and famine that struck the people of North Korea. He also involved North Korea in state-sponsored terrorism. 
and worked to strengthen the role of the military within North Korea. He tightened the security around the country and kept it and made it even more so secretive than it even had been. In 1994, November 1994, the channel, the underground tunnel, under the channel, the English channel, connecting England and France, opened for passenger service. So the photo of that map here, picture of that, one of the channel trains, and this is when the engineers broke through underneath the channel, and the French and the British finally connected there. In December of 1994, uh, the first Chechen war began. It was a rebellion by the Chechen Republic of Echkiria against the Russian Federation. So Chechnya is a section of Russia. So here, if you look in this middle map, um, but here in the corner of that map, you can see a more, a wider view of the area. You can see it is this small region here where the pointer the point of that arrow is. So that is the same as this area. This war was fought from December of 1994 until August of 1996. Well, the Chechen forces did eventually win the war. The Russian federal forces were set back, mostly by Chechen guerrilla warfare. And as a result of that guerrilla warfare, the Chechen forces were able to declare victory. Um, there was also almost universal opposition um, of the Russian public to this conflict. And so it led Boris Yeltsin's government to eventually declare a ceasefire in 1996. And then a year later, they signed a peace treaty. However, just because the Chechen forces won did not mean that everything was great for the Chechen people. 500,000 people were displaced, uh, even more than that really, were displaced by this conflict and cities and villages were left in ruin as a result of it. And if you look behind this soldier here on the picture to the right, you can see one of those bombed cities. If you're looking to read anything about this, there's an excellent book by a man named Anthony Mara. It is called A Phenomena of Vital Con a, a Vital Constellation Phenomena. And it is an excellent, excellent book that looks into the impact of both the first and Second Chechen Wars, and I highly recommend that book. Then, focusing a little bit more back on the United States here for a moment, uh, on October 3rd, 1995, after an 11 month long, highly public trial, former football player O.J. Simpson was acquitted, was found not guilty of murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her boyfriend, Ron Goldman. So the murder took place on June 12th, 1994. Um, many of you may have heard of and may know of, if you see this picture here on the very far right, the famous car chase. Um, on June 17th, O.J. Simpson was asked to surrender by police. Uh, he did not. He instead got in his white Bronco and led the police in a very long chase. Well, eventually they did catch up to him. He was arrested. On January 24th, 1995, his trial started. And on October 3rd, 1995, his acquittal shocked the United States and it shocked the people when the jury returned that not guilty verdict. So some images here for you. Um, I realize that one particular image is a bit bloody, um, but if you are interested in seeing more images, um, there are plenty of them, but I tried to keep them um, a little cleaner um, and not really show anything too grotesque. Um, a lot of images from the trial and from their past life. This is a picture of OJ with Nicole. Um, while they were still together. And again, this is Nicole Brown Simpson here in the middle and her boyfriend at the time, Ron Goldman, who was also murdered. Then further focusing on the United States for a moment, uh, on April 19th, 1995, we see domestic terrorism 
strike in the very center of America when Timothy McVeigh bombed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. 168 people were killed. That included 19 children. There was a daycare attached to the building and 19 children from that daycare were murdered when this bomb was set off. McVeigh's motive for this attack was largely retaliation for the siege at Waco that I talked about in the last video, as well as some other government-led sieges, one at Ruby Ridge in Idaho and a few others that had occurred. And McVeigh also said he was very angry about U.S. foreign policy. So in response, Timothy McVeigh and another man, Terry Nichols, carried out this bombing um, that absolutely devastated Oklahoma City and the United States. Both bombers were tried and convicted in 1997. McVeigh died. Uh, he was given the death penalty in June of 2001, and Nichols was given life in prison. In July of 1995, we finally see United States and Vietnamese relationship uh, become a normal relationship again. After a 20-year hiatus of severed ties, then U.S. President Bill Clinton announced the formal normalization of diplomatic relations between the United States of America and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam on July 11th, 1995. Embassies were opened in both countries and trade began to occur regularly between the two countries as well. Then on July 1st, 1997, Great Britain gave Hong Kong over to China, ending 155 years of British colonial rule. Hong Kong became China's first SAR, Special Administrative Region, and it was agreed that they would exist under the theory one country two systems, which would allow the people of Hong Kong to retain, to keep their capitalist economy and political system, while the rest of China was still socialist and used a socialist system. So one country, two different systems would occur. China promised, when this happened, to respect Hong Kong's political system and their political liberties. Uh, it is goes perhaps without saying, for those of you that follow the news, but that did not remain the case. It has not remained the case. Today, 23 years into this agreement, tensions are very, very high. China continues to crack down on democracies in Hong Kong. There have been consistent demonstrations for months now. Those demonstrations were largely put on hold because of the coronavirus and social distancing policies that were put into place. Um, China has arrested a large number of political leaders over the last month, month and a half, um, while these coronavirus policies were established. They have used this time to try to crack down on who they see as political dissidents within Hong Kong. Then on August 31st, 1997, Britain's Princess Diana died in a car crash in Paris. She, along with her driver, her bodyguard, and her partner, uh, were driving in a road tunnel in Paris, and the car crashed. Their driver, Henry Paul, was drunk and on drugs, the autopsy revealed. He lost control of the car while he was driving, and no one, none of them, not Diana, not her partner, Dodi Fayed, not the driver, Henry Paul, and not her bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, none of the four individuals in the car were wearing seatbelts when the accident occurred. Dodi and Henry Paul were killed. Uh, they died at the scene, and Diana died in the hospital later on. The bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, he survived. The accident, he did come out with serious injuries that he eventually recovered from. Princess Diana was only 36. 
when she was killed. And while it was estimated that almost 1 billion people watched her wedding to Prince Charles, um, many tuned into the funeral as well, and the world certainly mourned her death. People called her, she was known as the people's princess. She was beloved around the world, and the world cried for her death, and the world watched her funeral when it occurred. Lots of memorials made to her. You can see an image of one here on the bottom right, and newspaper headlines the day after she was killed. Then, in the late 1980s, the violence in Ireland that we've talked about a bit, known as the Troubles, finally began to slow. On August 10th, 1998, the Good Friday Agreement was signed. This agreement officially ended the Troubles. It, you know, put an actual ceasefire to the fighting between the people in Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, it was signed by the Irish and British governments. But it did not bring an end to the hatred, to the grudges, to any of the social problems that existed between the Northern Ireland and the, the people of Ireland and the people of Northern Ireland. So this agreement is signed that violence comes to an end, but it did not officially end all of the problems. Then, At the nearing the end of the 1990s, um, from December 19th, 1998 until February 12th, 1999, President Bill Clinton faced his impeachment hearings and trial in the House and the Senate of the United States Congress. He was impeached by the House of Representatives. However, he was not convicted by the Senate. And so by escaping conviction, he was allowed to remain in office. He was charged with lying under oath, committing perjury, and obstructing justice. Um, he was not impeached specifically for having an affair. However, um, he was asked about things relating to the affair in a deposition and in a deposition you are legally bound to tell the truth just as you are if you are sworn in in a trial same idea you are sworn in in a deposition and during that um, he lied to try to cover up the affair and that lying was committing perjury and then he obstructed justice to keep people from finding out about it. And so that is what he was impeached for, but the Senate did not convict him and he was allowed to remain president. And still today, a very popular president, um, very well known for many of the things he did with the economy. And people generally have a positive view of Clinton's presidency today. Then, both India and Pakistan tested nuclear weapons for the very first time in 1998. These tests raised major concerns, as we've talked about a little bit. Uh, these countries are rivals. They've been rivals since they became two separate countries. And those differences have led to war in the past. They led to war in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, continue to do so in the 90s, and to date still have many struggles between the two countries. And as those tensions today have continued to increase, especially over that region of Kashmir that we've spoken about, uh, the world, the global community at large is concerned that at some point, these countries may use their nuclear weapons against one another. Finally, reaching the very end of 1999, on December 31st, 1999, Panama took control of the Panama Canal. Remember, in September of 1977, President Jimmy Carter signed a treaty to recognize Panama as the full owner of the canal, but allowed the United States operating rights until December 31st, 1999. So on December 31st, 1999, 22 years after that agreement was signed, the Panamanians took full control 
of the canal. A very happy day of celebrations within Panama. And that evening, December 31st, 1999, everybody was terrified that when that ball dropped on midnight, the world might come to an end. Looking back now, it may seem a little silly, uh, but people were very concerned. This was a major concern at the turn of the century. No one knew what would happen. Uh, and a lot of people thought that computers, electricity, technology may just come to a halt. Lots of people were concerned about the Y2K crisis, which we of course know now did not happen despite the fact that many people prepared for it. But as the clock turned midnight and made it January 1st in the year 2000 and a brand new century began, people did so with optimism toward a new century. For your assignment to go along with this second video, uh, you are going to, again, just like you did with the 1960s, choose one of the topics that I talked about here and do a little bit of research on it. Look at it in more detail and talk a little bit about it. There is an assignment sheet there, has some questions on it for you, and you can take a look at it and uh, learn a little bit more about one of these topics. Choose one that interests you, okay? Focus on something that you find interesting. It can be something light, something heavy, um, but make sure it's something that does interest you. As always, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask.